Welcome back to Asian Art. In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of the Mughal arts and focus on painting, how it grew and developed under the Mughal dynasty. To begin with, let's look at painting as we know it shortly before the arrival of the Mughal tradition. Here we see one of the few surviving paintings that come from this time. This is done in a manuscript called Charu Pancha Sika, and thus this style is referred to as the Charu Pancha Sika style. In it we can see depictions of the deities, Hindu deities, Brahma, bowing before the avatar of Vishnu, is Krishna. In this painting, uh, which is partially damaged, we can see the goose, which is the Vahana, or Mount of Brahma, on the far left. And then we see Brahma prostrated before the dark blue Krishna. Now, the figure is flat and stylized, and there's an ornamental and decorative uh, foliage all around. Notice how the trees move and sway toward Krishna, and they sort of echo the movement of Brahma as he lies prostrate before Krishna. So the environment and the context is there to kind of enhance the feeling or rasa of the painting. The eyes and faces are bold and stylized, and the figures are fairly flat. There's no attempt to create any kind of depth or modeling in the painting. Here's another example of the Charapancha Sika style, and in it is a slightly better condition, and it is a wonderfully bold composition where this river runs the course off the frame, and inside the river we see these young gopis, these uh, women who are shepherds in the field, and they are caught bathing by, again, the avatar of Vishnu, Krishna, who has stolen their clothing and now sits in a tree above them. Girls are pleading for the return of their clothing. And this is sort of an allegory for them, you know, praying to Krishna sort of recognizing him as a god or a deity. Krishna, for his own trickster ways, tells the girls not to worry. He is a god and he can see through uh, their clothes at, any, at will. So this is part of the sort of playful and spiritual and yet secular ways in which these Hindu stories are related. Notice the wonderful churning excitement of the river. This adds a lot of energy and feeling, again, rasa, to the composition. Again, the figures are fairly flat. There's no modeling on any of the forms. And the trees and everything kind of echo the shapes and design of the composition. Now we return to Mughal, India. India, which was in the region of Delhi and Agra, where we found the Taj Mahal we spoke of in our last lecture. Akbar was the first of the Mughal emperors who was able to fully utilize the atelier of painters that his father, Humayun, brought to court. Akbar was favor of the painters, and he used this very large workshop of painters to make many thousands of beautiful paintings during his lifetime. Painters received a special status at court, and they worked uh, to develop their style uh, in close concert with what the Emperor Akbar wished for. Here we actually see the painters and bookmakers at work, and it is a sort of instructive on their highly skilled and trained craftsmanship. So these paintings would not be hung in public, 
but they would be bound in volumes and they would be presented in court uh, for the pleasure of Akbar. They were intended to used for his own personal entertainment and edification. So Mughal painting is very closely related to Persian painting. Many of the master painters that were brought over uh, from Persia in the Middle East uh, brought with them very specialized skills for rendering and modeling lifelike forms. But if we compare Persian painting to Mughal painting, we can see that Mughal painting is far more realistic, more naturalized colors, more detailed in its compositions, and a way that they were to render the human figure in a much more believable manner. Also, Mughal painting tended to be larger. The Persian paintings would be something more the size of a standard notebook, whereas Mughal paintings could be almost twice as large. Still small, but much more dramatic, and a much richer and deeper attention to composition and detail. Another important influence on Mughal painting actually comes from Western Europe. The Mughal court was fascinated with Uh, Italian art, and they incorporated these ideas into their sense of naturalism. You can see this influence directly in an imitation of an Italian engraving, which was painted at the Mughal court. This Italian engraving of the martyrdom of Saint Cecilia, you can see very telling details in the composition. But on closer examination, despite the very careful reproduction, you can see some telling differences. Not only is the Mughal court introduced very bright colors, but if you look, the depth of the shadows and that sense of a single source of light which cuts across the Italian engraving from the upper left to the lower right that sense of the light coming in on the scene, this light really is wholly absent. Now, clearly, the artists of the Mughal court could see this shadow that came into the scene, but there was a sense that this heavily modeled, what they call chiaroscuro in Italy, was too realistic, was too much like creating something like God's creation. And so they flatten out the figure and they remove those kinds of very realistic details. Here is an example of one of the early major works done at court for Akbar. It is the story of the Hamza Nama. The Hamza Nama is a very famous tale that came from Persia. It was a favorite of Akbar's. It is a fantastic fable of the legends of the uncle of Muhammad. Now, Muhammad did have an actual uncle, and he was a powerful warrior who was famous in his own time. But these legends, after his death, grew to such an extraordinary extent and incorporated all kinds of fantastic fables and myths and legends. It, in many ways, resembles the story of King Arthur in England. King Arthur was some historical hero, but of course the tale of the the knights of the round table isn't entirely built on a kind of fantastic fables and legends that surrounded the time of King Arthur. So we see in this painting of the gardeners beating the giant Zumrud Shah who is trapped in a well, we can see the giant uh, is sort of uh, beset by these these, uh, gardeners. And there's a wonderful sort of playful detail. I also want to point out these bears who are sort of oblivious to the fight that's happening in the center of the picture as they are arguing over an orange. I point this out because uh, the story of Hamza Nama is full of artistic digressions and diversions. 
And though we don't fully know the story that was uh, painted here, only about 250 of the over 1,000 uh, 400 paintings that were made at Akbar's court of the Hamza Nama. With so little evidence in remaining, the actual story that they're based on has been lost to us. Here's another very interesting painting from the Hamza Nama. And this is a painting which is, represents the birth of, the, of Muhammad. Now, this sort of mythical depiction of the birth of Muhammad, that at the time of his birth, there was a great tumult in the city. All of the pagan images and the shrines fell off the wall, and the, the waters and the oceans began to boil. And you can see all the sea creatures there in great turmoil, and all the people who are confused by this extraordinary event. You see how their arms are raised in, in surprise and wonder. So, at the birth of Muhammad, we see these miraculous things happen. And the significance of the pagan idols falling off the walls is similar to the moment when Muhammad later in life would enter Mecca and banish all the pagan idols around the Kaaba. And so this is a kind of precursor to the iconoclasm of Muhammad during his own lifetime. It is also, if you look closely, you'll notice that all of the faces of all of the figures in this composition have been rubbed out. It's as if the painting itself has been suffered by iconoclastic impulses later on. At the time it was painted, the Mughal court painters felt it was okay to paint faces. But later on, perhaps hundreds of years later, this painting came into the possession of someone who was uncomfortable with the depiction of human faces, and they rubbed them out as they felt discomfort at the representation of so much that was like God's creation. Here you can see a closer detail of the rubbed out faces, even, ironically, the faces of the pagan idols falling upside down on the ground. Shah Jahangir was the son of Akbar, and he too was fond of painters and painting. His style gravitated even more toward the European naturalism. You can see a great attention to detail in this very famous painting of Jahangir on the hourglass throne from 1625. In this painting, we see Jangir seated on this magnificent throne with a pillow behind him. Now, the throne is not just an ordinary throne. The back of it is this sun disk with a kind of moon arc that he is, a sort of a celestial divinity. And then up in the sky, we see cherubim flying about. And then down below, we see cherubim below, sort of lamenting the sand that is falling from the hourglass. There is no evidence that Jangir actually owned such a throne of an hourglass. It is an allegory of his limited time on earth. And the cherubim are lamenting the fact that he is not immortal. In this painting, we see Jahangir handing a Quran to a Sufi sheikh, a holy man of the Sufi order, and is a way in which he is recognizing the authority, even though he stands above them and is giving them this Quran as, as a recognition of their importance. Lower down on the picture, we see a European courtier who is looking out toward us in the picture frame. And below that, if you look very closely, you can see the artist himself, Jangir, uh, holding up a picture. It is extraordinary that in this composition, where we see Shah Jahangir at court in this uh, way with his other courtiers, 
in attendance, we find that Big Deer here has a, a presence at court which is respected enough that he can add his own appearance into the composition. This is a, something that is quite remarkable for this time period. Prior to this time, artists were not known by their name. They seldom left any record at all of what, who they were or attached themselves to um, their paintings. But during this time, just like in the Italian Renaissance, artists were gaining a great deal of fame. Mughal court painting would soon die out after Jahangir, Jahangir's son, Shah Jahan, was not particularly fond of painting. He was the emperor who built the Taj Mahal. He was more interested in jewels and diamonds and large architectural monuments. And so, following Jangir, the painting uh, studio came into disuse and eventually was closed when Aurangzeb came to power. It was completely disbanded, and the painters sought employment elsewhere at Hindu courts. And so the techniques and ideas of Mughal painting were dispersed throughout India. And we can see their influence in this more uh, realistic-styled Indian painting with the Hindu theme of the goddess Kali, or Durga, slaying demons. This is a spectacular painting which really evokes this idea of rasa, the feeling of disgust and wonder at this powerful, destructive goddess who is laying low tyrants and demons, and the other demons are cowering from her presence. And this is a way in which the Mughal painting would kind of remove itself from the ideas of everyday life and sort of go further into the realm of fantasy. Here is a, another lovely Mughal-influenced Hindu painting where we see Krishna again as a young boy uh, with dark blue skin here dipping his hand in a butter churn while his mother is being distracted by his brother Baladewa this is a wonderful and playful composition because it tells a story that is well known from the Puranas when Krishna had his brothers lead her mother away so that he could grab a taste of the butter for himself. She, of course, quickly turns back and catches him in the act of stealing the butter. And in that moment, she demands that he open his mouth so she can see with her own eyes, what butter he has stolen. Krishna opens his mouth, and his mother sees the entire cosmos and recognizes that he is a god. She also sees butter, and so she spanks him. This, again, is one of these stories which is where the Hindu traditions mix the secular and the profane and give new insight to the Hindu tradition within the ordinary and everyday life. Let's have some review. What did the Hindu painting look like before the Mughal dynasty? Question 2. How did the Mughal painting mix the styles of Persian and European painting? What purpose did painting have for the Mughal rulers? What happened to the Hamza Nama painting of the birth of Muhammad? Question 5. How did Hindu painting change under Mughal influence?